Why is a modern submarine divided into distinct pressurized compartments? The answer isn't just about structural integrity, it is about survival. But this life support system exists to protect one thing, the nuclear Trident 2D5 missile. But firing a missile inside a submarine would destroy the boat, so how'd they do it? While well, they use a high-pressure cold launch to punch the weapon through the ocean's surface before the main engines ever turn on. But here is the real mystery. We have the Minutemen 3 on the ground and the B-2 Spirit in the air. So why do we spend billions to put nukes under the ocean? Well, unlike vulnerable silos or bombers, a submarine vanishes. Even if the entire map is wiped clean by nuclear weapons, the sub remains hidden in the dark, ready to launch the final counterattack if needed, all in the video ahead. Inside the hull, the Ohio class is divided into five distinct zones. And here is our detailed 3D model's cross-section. First, the bow, the ship's eyes and ears. Second, operations, the brain and crew quarters. Third, the payload, home to 24 Trident missiles. Fourth, power, the nuclear reactor. And finally, propulsion, the turbines driving this beast through the deep. But what makes the Ohio-class submarine one of the stealthiest objects in the ocean? It starts with the skin. If you were to touch the hull, you wouldn't feel cold, smooth steel. Instead, you would feel a rough, rubber-like layer. These are anechoic tiles. Thousands of these stealth rubber tiles are glued to the exterior. They serve a critical purpose. They absorb enemy sonar sound waves rather than reflecting them back. This effectively makes the submarine invisible to active sonar, appearing like a black hole in the water. Once inside, how is this massive vessel structured? Inside the cylindrical hull, the ship is built like a four-story building. It has four distinct decks. The interior is rigorously divided into separate sections by heavy bulkheads. Why is it divided this way? It is a matter of survival. These create watertight compartments. If one section breaches and floods, the crew can seal it off to prevent the heavy water from dragging the entire boat to the bottom. Just how big is an Ohio-class submarine? Well, if you stood next to it, you would feel microscopic. At 560 feet, this vessel is actually longer than the Washington Monument laid on its side. It spans nearly two American football fields. If you stood on the hull, the top of the sail would tower four stories above you. And it weighs as much as 40 U.S. Air Force One planes. While the most important question is the entire submarine pressurized, actually no, the submarine is a ship within a ship. The crew lives inside the pressure hull, a high-strength steel cylinder that maintains normal atmospheric pressure. However, the nose of the ship, where the sonar sits, and the tail section are free-floating areas. These parts sit outside the pressure hull and are filled with water when submerged to balance pressure. But where are the eyes and brain of the ship located? At the very front, outside the pressure hull, sits the sonar sphere, the ears of the submarine. It is located in the nose for isolation, placing the ship's sensors as far away as possible from the noise of the engine room at the back. Just behind that, inside the pressure hull, is the brain of the submarine, the command and control section. This is the nerve center. Directly above this room is the sail or conning tower, which houses the periscopes. They are located here because the sail is the highest point of the ship. This allows the captain to extend the scope and see above the waves while the massive hull remains safely hidden deep underwater. How does the crew enter, and where do they live? The crew enters through logistics hatches, narrow vertical tubes with ladders that drop from the deck down into the hull. Once inside, life revolves around the galley, the kitchen and dining area, located on the middle deck of the forward compartment. If you look from a different angle, you can see the galley is very small. This is the morale center of the ship, and since it is very small, they do eat in batches. As for sleeping or berthing, the crew sleeps in stacked bunks in the forward section. In some cases, junior sailors have to hot rack, meaning three sailors share two bunks in shifting rotations. The officers share small stator rooms with two or three bunks. The captain is the only person with a private cabin located directly near the control room so he can be on the con in seconds. The sick bay is also located in this forward section. It is small but fully equipped. Independent duty corpsmen can even perform minor surgeries here if the sub cannot surface. Let's move back to the captain and his command and control center. These old nuclear submarines are slowly being upgraded with artificial intelligence, making it much easier for this captain and crew to read sonars. For example, this is how they use machine learning algorithms to filter out background noise and highlight anomalies that might be an enemy submarine. 
giving the captain more time to pick the right target using AI. Speaking of artificial intelligence, 2025 is almost over. You still have 30 days to learn AI and step into 2026. With this two-day live AI mastermind training on Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. And the best part is it is free instead of the usual $395. It's the world's first AI-focused platform rated 4.9 on Trustpilot with over 10 million professionals trained. This 16-hour live course led by AI experts from Microsoft and Nvidia teaches you how to use AI to simplify tasks, build AI agents, automate workflows with tools like Sheets and Notion, and create AI systems for work or business. Graduates from OutSkills have launched AI businesses earning four to $5,000 weekly. Plus, if you attend both days, you get $5,000 worth of bonuses, including a prompt Bible and personalized AI toolkit. Seats are limited, so grab yours now via the link in the description or scan the QR code and join the WhatsApp community to stay updated before the big blast. Moving to the middle of the ship, we arrive at the most distinct section of the submarine. These tubes are so huge that they essentially become the walls of the crew's daily life. In fact, when the ship isn't in battle stations mode, this area acts as a commons. Sailors actually walk, work, and even job around these nuclear silos to stay fit during their long patrols. But how does a ship this size stay at sea for months without stopping for gas? The answer lies behind a thick, lead-shielded wall at the rear of the ship, the S-8G nuclear reactor. This incredible machine is preloaded with enough nuclear fuel to run for 20 years straight. That means this submarine only needs to be refueled once in its entire 40-year life. We all know the propellers creates a lot of unwanted sound. So how does it stay silent during a sneak attack? Well, the Ohio engineers came up with a brilliant solution called natural circulation. At high speeds, the reactor needs pumps to move the cooling water and pumps make noise. But at low patrol speeds, the crew could actually turn those pumps off. They rely on the natural physics of heat convection to circulate the water through the reactor, making the cooling system nearly silent. Furthermore, the massive steam turbines aren't bolted directly to the hull. Instead, they are mounted on sound dampening rafts that literally float inside the ship. These rafts absorb the vibrations of the engine, ensuring that the shaking of the machinery never reaches the metal skin, keeping the submarine invisible to the ears of the enemy. As stated, Trident missiles launch from deep beneath the ocean. But why go to such extreme lengths to do it, rather than simply surfacing the boat to fire? To answer this, you have to understand the role of the Ohio-class submarine. These vessels represent the most critical leg of the nuclear triad. They are high-value assets, silent guardians carrying a payload designed to deter global conflict. But despite their power, they have one massive weakness, visibility. In the past, submarines often had to surface to use their weapons, but in modern warfare, that is a death sentence. The minor submarine breaches the surface to prepare for a launch, it lights up on radar and satellite imagery. It becomes a sitting duck, instantly vulnerable to being destroyed by a naval torpedo from an enemy ship or an anti-submarine aircraft. If the sub has to surface, the enemy has a chance to stop the launch before it even begins. The strategic missile doctrine shifted to a single driving idea. What if you could fire the missile from under the ocean and remain invincible? By mastering the engineering of the deepwater launch, the submarine never has to reveal its position. It hovers in the darkness, hidden by the thermal layers of the ocean, completely invisible to radar. It ejects the weapon while submerged, and by the time the missile actually breaks the surface and becomes visible to the enemy, the submarine is already silent, moving, and safe in the deep. This capability guarantees that no matter what happens on the surface, the submarine remains the ultimate, untouchable insurance policy. How exactly you fire the missile without burning up the submarine carrying it? To understand this feat of engineering, we have to go midships, deep inside the Ohio-class submarine to a compartment nicknamed Sherwood Forest, so-called because of its forest of vertical orange launch tubes. Let's say one of the missile tube is active. The most important thing to realize is that the missile never ignites its engine inside the boat. Doing so would turn the submarine into a furnace. Instead, engineers rely on a technique called a cold launch, which essentially turns the launch tube into a massive steam cannon. Well, the process begins with equalization. The heavy seal muzzle hatch on the outer hull hydraulically slides open, but the missile remains dry, protected from the ocean by a hard, phenolic composite closure dome that seals the top of the tube. When the command of fire is finally given, a solid propellant gas generator, essentially a high-powered explosive, detonates here. 
but this fire isn't fed directly to the missile. Instead, it is blasted in a cooling water chamber. The intense heat instantly flash vaporizes the water, creating a massive, expanding pulse of steam and gas. This steam hammer strikes the bottom of the missile carrier with a violent heave, punching the massive weapon upward and out of the submarine. This leads to the most critical few seconds, the underwater phase. As it rises, the missile doesn't actually touch the water directly. It rides inside a bubble of its own exhaust gas known as ullage, which envelops the rocket body to reduce drag and protect the delicate airframe. It has to hit a precise exit speed of around 100 miles per hour. If it moves too slowly, it could fall back onto the sub too fast and the pressure changes could crush the casing. Meanwhile, the submarine performs an instant balancing act. As 65 tons of missile leave the boat, the vessel suddenly becomes 65 tons lighter. To stop the sub from lurching upward and exposing itself, the hovering system instantly floods the empty launch tube with ocean water, keeping the boat rock steady. Then comes the brooch. The trident shatters the ocean surface, erupting into the air surrounded by a crown of spray and steam. For a heartbeat, it coasts upward on momentum alone, momentarily suspended in gravity's grip. Onboard, inertial sensors detect this sudden drop in drag, the sensation of zero G, and confirm the missile is clear of the water. Roughly one to two seconds after the breach, the first stage solid rocket motor ignites. A blinding flash of orange fire vaporizes the trailing water into a massive white cloud, and immediately, a telescoping arrow spike shoots out from the nose. This needle-like probe creates a shockwave that pushes the air aside, reducing drag by nearly 50% and allowing the blunt nose cone to slice through the dense lower atmosphere. Now a streak of light climbing at Mach speeds, the missile sheds its stages one by one. At 65 seconds, fuel is gone and stage one detaches. Stage two takes over immediately, pushing us all the way to space. Once we're high enough, the air resistance is gone, two small rockets pop the nose cap off. Now. Here's the cool part. The Trident's third stage isn't stacked on top like a normal rocket. It's nestled inside the equipment section to save space. When the third stage is done, we're left with the bus. Its job is simple. Drive to a spot, drop off a passenger, the warhead, and then back away carefully. It then recalculates and drives to the next drop-off zone. Back on Earth, the sub slips into the darkness, vanishing before anyone knows what happened. Let's look what's inside the nuclear warhead. At the heart of the design is a two-stage system, the primary and the secondary. Here is the explosive that triggers the plutonium pit, causing it to implode uniformly to a critical mass. A mixture of tritium and deuterium is also injected into the pit to boost the explosion. This fierce fission explosion releases a flood of X-rays. These X-rays shoot down to the secondary, where they initiate fusion and fission between uranium-235 and lithium components creating a massive release of energy. It's this blend of fission and fusion that gives modern nuclear bombs their immense power and efficiency. The result? A devastating blast radius of nearly 2.9 miles, and thermal radiation strong enough to cause third-degree burns up to 8 miles from ground zero. But what if there is another Russian hunter submarine aiming for its destruction? The answer is this sonar-tracking torpedo. Pressurized air propels the torpedo toward its target. The piston engine with propellers maximizes the torpedo's speed. It trails a wire plugged into the weapons systems aboard the sub using data to navigate. The torpedo accelerates to 32 knots over 35 miles an hour with a range of 8 miles or 12 kilometers. As it nears its target, the wire is cut and its sonar takes over navigation. If a torpedo misses its target, it can circle back and starts hunting the target with its sonar. This one torpedo has the explosive power of 1,200 pounds of TNT. But what happens when the sub needs to dive fast? To do that, it relies on a clever system called ballast tanks. In a submarine, there are ballast tanks attached to both the front and back and even in the middle. Let's take a look at this submarine cross-section from the front. The tanks have flood ports at the bottom and valves at the top. In order for the submarine to submerge, it opens the flood ports. As soon as the back and front ballast tanks are filled, the submarine will then start to dive or descend just as shown in the animations. In order to move to the surface, 
Air under pressure is pumped into it to blow the water out of the ballast tank. The submarine will rise as a result of buoyancy, which we all know, all liquids and gases in the presence of gravity exert an upward force. But that's not it. The submarine also needs to steer. We have here the Virginia-class submarine. It can turn left or right by using the rudders. These are the elevators of the submarine present at the back, and they also have a retractable dive planes located at the front. They control the ship's angle, which means they can go up or down. To understand all the nuclear triad, do check part one of our video here.